Candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. This is the most famous couplet written by one of the early 20th century poets called Ogden Nash. Ogden Nash was an American poet born on 19th August 1902 and he was known for his light-hearted humorous satire. For his entire span of professional writing career ranging from 1930s up until late 1960s, he was considered as the only comic poet at that time. It was very difficult because to introduce a social and a political element in a very funny way was something uh, was of not everybody's forte. Let's take one of the examples. One of the poetries by Ogden Nash is called The Old Men, which goes something like this, that people expect old men to die. They don't really mourn old men. Old men are different. People look at them with the eyes that wonder when. People watch with the unshocked eyes, but old men know when an old man dies. You see, Ogden Nash has broken the conventional rules of poetry over here. You might see that when we are studying or breaking down or dissecting poetry, we are taught about the rhyme schemes like A-A-B-B or A-B-A-B. But Ogden Nash was known to break free of those conventions and write in something what we technically call as free verse. Uh, if we are to consider a 14 syllable three line haiku or a 14 liner sonnet or a five liner limerick, Ogden Nash was particularly known to come out of those norms and write something of his own. He would often use amalgamation of words and try to make a comical homophone out of it. Like a couplet goes something like this, that a girl who's bespectacled may not get her neck tickled. Now the neck tickled is spelled something like N-E-C-T-A-C-L-E-D, which is a homophone to neck tickled. Now let's not get him wrong over here, he's not taking a jab at a girl who is wearing specs, but it is a satire which explains that for someone who is looking at the world through somebody else's eyes, which is bespectacled, will not be able to get her neck tickled, which means will not be able to enjoy the world in its true form. Let's take another example of a, of a quadruplet, a four-liner, which goes something like this, that Miss Rafferty in Taffeta drew definitely raffisher, Miss Cavendish in Lavender drew less and less standoffisher. Nothing makes sense, right? But if you see Miss Rafferty in Taffeta grew raffisher, which is sort of a mispronunciation of the word ravishing. Coming from late 1940s, this poetry often shows that the slangs Ogden Nash used often influenced his poetry as well. Ogden Nash was also known to highlight the stereotypes of his era, American or otherwise. His poems often uh, wrote about the times, uh, the difficulties that the people often faced at uh, a very basic level. Uh, not that he refrained from talking about the socio-political environment, but he had a way to put it in a very subtle manner, which gave him the label of a comic poet. At that time, poetry was often taken as a, a medium which would reflect revolutionism or activism. Unfortunately, Ogden Nash did not fall under those pretexts and broke out of those norms because of his individual satire. Now, let's take up a case wherein he has written a poem called Away From It All. All right? And it goes something like this, that I wish I were a Tibetan monk living in a monastery. I would unpack my trunk and store it in a tronistry. I would collect all my junk and send it to a jonistry. And I would reform a drunk and pay all his expense to a dronistry. And if my income were shrunk, I would send it to a shonistry. Now, Ogden Nash is trying to portray over here that how the worldly desires can be put away and aside, whether it be intoxicants when he's talking about the drunk, when it's about possessions when he's talking about the trunk, when it's about unnecessities when he's talking about junk, you can keep them away and still live a life very, very happily. But do you see how humorously he puts it down in his words and it's not a jab at anybody's sentimental value. Now, wordplay is one of the Nash's trump cards. 
The key factor to notice over here is that he was not misspelling any word, but he was mispronouncing the word. The takeaway from this so far is that poetry gives you a certain liberty to able to play with the words. Let's say if there's a painter and we ask them to paint a portrait or a face right out of imagination, what they would do is that they would take the contours, the face of the multiple people that they know, put them all together and come up with something brand new. Now replace those contours with words and imagine what a poet can do with that. Imagine if you were able to coin something new, if you were able to join or amalgamate two or three or more words and give it a meaning. That's what poets are here for. We are given a liberty to venture into the unknown of a language and unfold something about it and put it forth to the masses for them to understand that something exists beyond the known. Now Nash has made complete use of his liberty. There's a piece which goes something like this and it's titled Fee Fi Ho Hum, No Wonder Baby Sucks Her Thumb. Written in about late 1950s, it's about the fact that how children look up to their own parents and the legacy continues. Now you see, it's something which was written about 60, 70 years ago and still holds true. Something as timeless as that had to be created at that point, not because he followed the norms, but because Ogden Nash thought that he could break out of it and create something of his own. Now, originally, Ogden Nash wanted to recreate the same serious process which came from the 19th century. Unfortunately, he failed miserably at it. So he thought he's going to create something new and start something of his own, which allowed him to play with the words and then come out as a very comical satire. Because of his individual style, he was able to create his own niche. One of his lines go this way, that the cow is of a bovine ilk. One end is moo, the other milk. You see, he had this knack of taking unanimated objects, animals, situations, and compare them to us human beings. That sort of a style suited him the most and to be able to plug in a little sarcastic tone to it was his forte. For example, one of his poems called The Pig goes something like this, that the pig, if I'm not mistaken, supplies his sausage, ham and bacon. Let others say his heart is big, but I'm just going to call it a pig. You see, taking one of the animals, not that favorite except for its own culinary edge, he compares a pig to a very, very, very basic behavioral pattern of human being that no matter how many times whoever gives you what, a pig is somehow always going to remain a pig. Now Nash had one of the most free-flowing verses. Not that he was a rebel, but he was able to bring in something new to the table. Because of his free-flowing verse, he was able to write poetry in a very free form which was of uneven length mostly. Now let's take a couplet for an example. It is an excerpt from a poem called Chant at the End of the Beginningless Summer. It goes something like this, that the sky is overcast and I am undercast. The fog creeps in on little iceberg feet and then there's no retreat. So you see, the uneven scheme of the first and the second line shows that he did not follow the convention or the tradition of poetry, but still was able to make a mark. Something to learn from this for the young budding poets and including me as well is that two of the most difficult primal concepts of poetry is taken into consideration over here. First, comedy. Second, non-convention. It is very difficult to put comedy in a very subtle manner. Now comedy is very often trivialized or minimalized tragedy of somebody's life. Now to be able to put the tragedy on a pedestal, not undermining at the same time, is something very important. And to laugh at somebody's expense? No, we cannot do that. Nash was able to keep the comedy intact along with the fact that he was not undermining anybody's tragedy under any circumstance. Now let's take another example of it. One of his poems is called A Word to the Husbands. It goes something like this, that to keep your marriage brimming with love in the loving cup, Whenever you're wrong, admit it. Whenever you're right, shut up. 
Now this is something written in late 1950s and taking a jab at the egotistical nature of a standard generic husband, it does not limit itself to that particular satire. If you look closely at it in any relationship, you might find that if someone is right or wrong, they should take a stand in a certain manner. When Ogden is saying that whenever you're wrong, admit it. It's the acceptance, but whenever you're right, do not undermine somebody else. Shut up and accept the way the things are. Let's take another example. This couplet is called the parent. It goes something like this, that children aren't happy with nothing to ignore. Listen closely. Children aren't happy with nothing to ignore and that's what parents were created for. It's a very anticlimactic pun if you dissect it and if you realize that parents would create children but the poem says that that's what parents were created for. If you look closely, with the birth of a child, a parent is created too. But what's the advice over here? In a very subtle manner, Nash is trying to put forth Children are going to be the way they are. They might need something at one time, but might want to ignore it at the other time. But as a parent, you must understand that your duty is just to exist and let your child be. Now moving ahead, like we saw that Nash was able to take up very simple scenarios, put them out in a manner, but he also wrote a lot about animals. In fact, one of his collectives is called Ogden Nash's Zoo, which is entirely about animals and their behaviors and how they are more often than not are like us human beings all right one of his lines uh, coincides with an insect we might have heard about wasps and he puts a jab at it saying that he is not a big fan of hospitality maybe he was not a big fan of wasps or maybe he was not a big fan of people who were not welcoming at all now coming back to the Nash's style of writing he did not always leave the social and the political satire. He just did not write about them as fondly as many are did. One of his pieces called Love Under the Republicans portray that how he is requesting someone to live with him and because of the conditions that he is living in, he is not able to continue with them and ends up killing them. His take on the socio-economic structure and the infrastructure of the government does not partake hatred, nor does it call for rebellion against the power or, or the system. What he's doing is to subtly portray the conditions that he is living in and leaving it to the masses to decide. I believe as a poet, we can learn a lot by reading Nash's work that our job is not to dictate, it is not to throw opinions, but only to put forth the things that we believe in, our opinions, our perspectives, and let the masses decide what they think of it. Think of a poet like a bouncer to a club. It's up to the bouncer to let people in and out to maintain peace at that, but it's for the people to decide if they love the club or not. Nash's style shows that how a poetic idea can be a personal perspective and a personal perspective only. Beyond that circle, neither he nor does any individual have a control over what the world thinks. Be it a personal proof or a political standpoint, nothing has to be a dictative. It can be a thought-evoking literature, but one does not have to put forth the idea and to seed it in somebody else's mind. Poet, a conduit of an art form, the job or the work is to only bring in front a perspective, a side, that the masses are more often than not able to see. By reading Ogden Nash's work, this is something that an individual can learn. Now the point arises, why we should read Ogden Nash in this day and age? A style of poetry from early 20th century, what we can learn is that how we can break free from the convention and still be able to make our point. Another thing is that how to introduce comedy into your work without making it a hate speech or to hurt someone's sentimental value. Something which was once done about a century ago, I believe can be still done as young and budding poets, as young and budding writers, I believe we need to learn that. And we can only learn that 
by understanding the previous works of the great people. Now, having published over 500 poems, one of the most popular collection of Ogden Nash is called Candy is Dandy with the introduction by Anthony Burgess and you can find over 400 poems of his ranging from the era of 1930s up until 1970s and you can find all of his collection over there. To leave you with a quick message, I'm going to close with one of the most popular couplets by Ogden Nash, the couplet with which I opened with, but not promoting any intoxicants as such. Nash says, candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. Thank you. Hey guys, you made it to the end and thanks for listening to the views. If you want to know more about the poets, please subscribe to this channel and stay tuned for the updates. Thank you.